Live from New York, it's The Cube, covering Big Data NYC 2015. Brought to you by Hortonworks, IBM, EMC, and Pivotal. Now your host, Dave Vellante and George Gilbert. Welcome back to New York City, everybody. This is The Cube. We're here at Strata, Hadoop World, Big Data NYC. Tendu Yogorchu is here. She's the general manager of Big Data at SyncSort. Tendu, good to see you again. Welcome to The Cube. Hi, Dave. Hi, George. Uh, thank you for having me. So you're welcome. Um, so SyncSort, you guys are at the heart of this data transformation, this data tsunami that's going on. Uh, give us the update on, on SyncSort, what's going on at Strata and Hadoop World. Yes, of course, uh, this is actually an exciting time for us. Uh, in a row, third announcement today uh, came out uh, around the data processing. Uh, today we announced our integration with Apache Spark and Kafka, uh, top uh, active uh, projects in the uh, open source, uh, as you know. And uh, all of our innovation is really driven by the business use cases. In 2015, uh, our main focus was around offloading uh, expensive workloads from the legacy data warehouse, legacy ETL tools, and uh, mainframe to Hadoop. And uh, our announcement with uh, Dell, Cloudera, Intel, the partnership we uh, announced also is around that. However, we see increasing demand for real-time and streaming use cases. Uh, fraud detection in finance, uh, healthcare, uh, digital devices, internet of things, uh, telemetry data uh, collection. All of these uh, use cases are driving uh, streaming and real-time uh, workloads. And organizations are really interested in uh, having a single software environment where uh, they can uh, uh, utilize for batch and uh, real-time uh, workloads, taking advantage of the powerful compute frameworks like Apache Spark or uh, resilient uh, messaging framework as Kafka. And the timing is perfect, George, right? I mean, uh, the, yes, the, this the, is a, a the theme timely of ours, discussion. which is you know, the move from batch to real time, but also the presence of two pipelines, one to improve the decision-making process, and then one to execute those decisions really fast. Well, let's bump up a little mm -hmm. for our viewers who may not be as familiar with DMXH, and tell us what the tool does, and then let's drive, you know, uh, then let's dive into how we went from batch to near real time. Uh, uh, of course. Uh, basically, our data integration product, DMXH, uh, is a data integration product. It allows you to uh, define your data transaction, data processing transformation uh, pipeline. And now, with our dynamic optimization and intelligent execution, you can take that data pipeline and you can run it uh, whether uh, it's uh, in MapReduce in Yarn or uh, in Spark and uh, uh, on-premise or in cloud or on your uh, Windows workstation. So this is really a powerful uh, story for the user because you are defining a single uh, data pipeline, single data processing uh, job, and uh, you are uh, basically uh, the product is uh, running in real time if the data source is real time, like Kafka streaming, or in batch if the data is uh, coming from HDFS, for example. And the author of this pipeline, um, the one who's designing it the first time, what are they? What are they working with? Are they working down in code? Are they are they working with a drag and drop GUI environment? How how does it look? They are working with a drag and drop a graphical user interface. They are just uh, basically defining their data sources, whether it's uh, databases, mainframe, or uh, Kafka streaming, the same way, and they can. Uh, uh, basically uh, drive the metadata, sample their data very easily, and define their uh, data transformation. So it's really, in terms of skill set, it simplifies uh, and it reduces the cost for operational expenses and maintenance for organizations. You don't have to go and hire a, a person who is uh, specialized in Scala, uh, Python, or have to understand what's the difference between Spark versus MapReduce. And just to be clear, so you've got this development environment that's a, a GUI development environment for your pipeline. Yes. Um, you're doing the uh, sourcing of the data that a data engineer might yes. do. You're doing the blending and enrichment that a, um, 
uh, maybe a, a data scientist might might data do. Data scientists uh, and to find you know what's what's relevant, but you're not focusing on the analytics. You you drop it off where the analytic to, analytics tools um, take on the next part of the job. Is that correct? That's correct. So basically, uh, we make the data available. Uh, whether it's the data lake, the HDFS, or uh, uh, any other uh, optimized uh, storage uh, the user may choose. And uh, we integrate that data, blend it, enrich it, and uh, prepare it for analytics or visualization tools like Click or uh, Tableau. And uh, Spark, uh, the, the way that uh, uh, Spark has the promise for real-time at batch is also driving our uh, interest uh, going into Spark. And one differentiation we have uh, from some of the legacy ETL vendors, our engine is running as part, natively as part of the data flows. Uh, that's uh, due to the, our continuous open source contributions. We have contributed to uh, MapReduce in Yarn significantly, so our engine can be actually a native uh, uh, Yarn uh, engine uh, running as part of the MapReduce flow. Likewise, uh, we started uh, contributing to uh, Spark, a couple of weeks ago we contributed a mainframe uh, connector for uh, Spark packages. So just to be clear, you're not just taking the pipeline that's defined in a graphical environment and then spitting out Spark code or MapReduce code, there's actually um, functions within those that are contributions you make to the open source community to make those run better when defined in your tool. That's correct, so instead of generating code uh, that we may not have one-to-one -one correspondence, we are actually uh, contributing to the open source uh, and uh, um, uh, using uh, the open source APIs and having an intelligent execution that decides how to run uh, a job in MapReduce fashion or in Spark, and that happens at execution, at runtime. Okay. I, I wonder if, I, I want to ask you about how you choose sort of where to focus your, your development yeah. dollars, because yeah. everybody's development dollars are limited. Um, we just did a survey, we got the results Friday, George and yeah. I were looking at it, and one of the questions we asked is, um, we asked them to about the workloads that they're using for the big data analytics, we asked them which ones are involve real time or near real time you know, capabilities. Fraud detection came up, workflow optimization, IT equipment operation support, mm -hmm. good news for Splunk, data transformation, um, and then we asked them, okay, what analytic tools are you using for mm -hmm. real time? You know, Kafka came up, but Kafka's relatively new, mm -hmm. um, especially sort of, you know, the guys who had Confluent, you know, spun out, yes. right? so that was like late last year. Um, data Torrent came up big, but then of course Spark Streaming and Storm. How do you choose where to put your bets? So, we, uh, uh, it's really driven by the adoption, and what we are seeing is the hard problems and the challenges our uh, customers have. Uh, so uh, there are three types of investments uh, we focus on. One, organic innovations, and in uh, organic innovations we try to have something that's going to decouple the uh, compute framework and reduce complexity, make these uh, very rapidly evolving uh, big data technology stack uh, easily adopted. Because that's the challenge. That's the challenge for the enterprise to be able to find people who understand all of the new projects and uh, make decisions. So that's uh, uh, when we uh, uh, go after organic innovations, we basically say, okay, uh, at the time, uh, half of our uh, customers are in production, which is uh, great. Uh, I'm really excited to be able to say that. And 80% uh, of those production workloads are 75, 80, is uh, still uh, offloading expensive workloads from data warehouse. So that's our bread and butter. And operational efficiency use cases are bread and butter for many of the Hadoop vendors as well. And uh, however, uh, we have to keep an eye on the strategic uh, uh, direction. What is ha going to happen in 2016 and 2017 with the internet of use cases and internet of uh, things use cases, streaming applications? Uh, a lot of financial services and healthcare and telecommunications companies are our customers, and they are interested in getting real-time insights. Fraud detection is big. Uh, digital devices in healthcare are big use cases. So they have this question, the way that I made a choice for a tool for MapReduce and uh, Yarn, I do not want to uh, 
have developers uh, uh, developing in Scala. I want to have something that's easy to be uh, easy to easily adopted. So that's that kind of uh, challenges that our customers are having is driving one type of innovation. And the second one is open source contributions. Uh, we always uh, continue, so we can have a differentiated uh, value that's complementary to the Hadoop vendors, as well as big data vendors like Databricks, so the uh, stack is accelerated. And the third one is inorganic uh, acquisitions, basically. Okay, so any of those you want to tell us about? No, <laughs> okay. Um, uh, so <laughs> <laughs> we are actively uh, always in, uh, <laughs> engaged and uh, looking. <laughs> have you, uh, as it relates to uh, uh, offload, you talked about that earlier, have you seen that movement attenuate at all, or are you seeing it ac accelerate? What's the status? I mean, everybody, you know, last year at this time, it was, you know, the big sucking sound, I call it. You know, yeah. take data off the uh, traditional data warehouse. Uh, are, comfortable, are customers comfortable with that? Have they gone too far? Are they slowing that down, or is it accelerating? I think it's still uh, accelerating. That's still uh, a very, uh, very valid use case uh, because uh, one third of the analytics happens in the data warehouse is really interactive real-time analytics and two thirds of the data warehouse is almost used for batch type of workloads and those batch workloads are very good candidates for uh, scalable big data uh, architectures and pretty much everybody is uh, open-minded uh, adopting new technologies and open source is uh, well received, uh, so that's, uh, uh, we don't see that slowing down yet. I, I, I think that's very much complemented uh, with the customer 360 kind of analysis, and uh, they start, at this point, they start thinking about what are the transformative applications that I should be investing, not just offloading workloads, and those transformative applications are driving the innovation. And, and what are some of those transformative workloads, and what are the kinks the customers have to work through in terms of skills, technical maturity, um, data source access? Uh, the, uh, the challenges are around uh, uh, bringing all of the different types of data together. Because uh, there are uh, tools uh, and a stack of tools that uh, uh, you can use one for one type of data, Scoop for database, Flume for streaming, uh, Kafka for streaming. So there are many tools. However, uh, uh, people are really trying to find a single interface that can simplify that for them. And the, the technology is uh, Storm Kafka for real time, and as you said, that Kafka is still going to mature. There's a lot of uh, interest because of high resilient uh, nature and distributed right. nature of Kafka. And uh, uh, Spark has uh, the promise of having the single platform uh, with interactive batch and real time uh, computer frameworks. Uh, they, these are all uh, going to mature and uh, we will see how the adoption is going to happen in the enterprise. You, you mentioned the open source connector to the mainframe before. Yeah, people don't like to talk about mainframe, but mainframe is interesting uh, to us because of its ability to bring uh, uh, traditional OLTP and analytic workloads together. Yes. You know, we were at an announcement in January at Jazz at Lincoln Center, IBM announced the new Z mainframe, and yes. it was interesting talking to the customers there. You know, not the, once you get through the IBM messaging, which is strong, but you talk to the customers and what they're doing in terms of actually bringing those together. We feel like it's a harbinger of what the open community is going to do, but I wonder if you could talk about that mainframe business and the parallels to the open business. It, you know, it seems to be, you know, give you visibility on what's going to occur sometimes. Yes. Well, I wonder if yeah, you could comment absolutely. on that. Yeah, absolutely. Mainframe is a, <laughs> a big interest for us also, yeah. as you know. Uh, we have a very successful uh, mainframe business. Right. So, mainframe is very important, and uh, the uh, mainframe is not going to go anywhere soon. It's uh, very well suited for transactional type of workloads. So, uh, while mainframe is very suited for transactional type of workloads, uh, Hadoop, uh, Spark, uh, the new uh, big data stack is uh, very suited for batch type of workloads. However, uh, our uh, mainframe open source connector is basically making Spark interactive, Spark SQL queries, uh, uh, available for mainframe access. So you, you have the mainframe data available for uh, interactive querying in Spark QL. Uh, that is a big advantage because now you can actually uh, have uh, some of the more affordable 
uh, real-time uh, interactive queries against your uh, legacy data and against your transactional data. So that's critical. We also, uh, in the Splunk conference, uh, we announced uh, uh, collecting net network and security data and making the mainframe logs available uh, for Splunk analytics. Last so week. we will continue to, uh, to have that bridge uh, between the mainframe and the open source and uh, big data technologies because we are in a very good position as a company. So I wonder if you could also comment. So something else that came up in the survey uh, related to Spark, it was significant percent were using Spark today, almost half, and everybody was of course evaluating Spark. You, mm -hmm. You're asleep if you're not evaluating Spark, but a very large proportion, I mean the majority of people mm -hmm. said that they're going to plan or, or, uh, or are actually substituting Spark for new workloads that would have gone to Hadoop. Now there seems to be a debate Mm -hmm. around that, right? The Hadoop guys go, oh, no, no, it's all complimentary. The Spark guy, Databricks, like, oh, it's just, it's just, you know, Hadoop is dead. What do you see? I mean, you really, I mean, you're kind of agnostic to yeah. that whole argument, right? You want to go where the business is and where the exactly. customers want you to go. So what do you actually see as a you know, technologist, as you know, somebody who's quasi-independent in that debate? What, what uh, in terms of the Hadoop have Spark uh, uh, adoption. That's uh, what we are seeing because uh, if you look at the last uh, four or five years, it has been such an exciting time for Hadoop and the disruption around Hadoop. And uh, uh, pretty much every single organization is looking at uh, revamping their enterprise data warehouse architecture and uh, redefining it uh, based on uh, Hadoop in the center. And it took a while for Hadoop to be matured. And a lot of vendors uh, had to come into the picture, a lot of applications had to come into the picture, uh, 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 building the ecosystem. Now, Hadoop just ma is maturing as a platform, and Spark is appearing. Spark running on Hadoop is just uh, uh, an easy way uh, uh, for organizations to adopt uh, capabilities of Spark, because they just uh, mature their platform. For uh, more online uh, businesses or uh, more uh, evangelist type of uh, businesses, they can directly go and uh, jump into Spark uh, bandwagon, and that's fine. However, for enterprise, we see Hadoop actually helping uh, Spark acceleration. So, that makes sense for the guys who have the ability to digest and manage all the Hadoop tool complexity. Yeah. Uh, but of course others have said to us, yeah, well, Spark is not without its complexities as well. Maybe it's simpler than Hadoop, but you know, you still got to know, you know specific programming languages yes. like Python and you know, it's maybe simplified. What are you seeing there? Is it, uh, uh, do, you, do, you, do you agree with that premise that, uh, that, that, that they're both you know, somewhat you know, heavy lifting or do they you have see Spark uh, as simplified? Uh, they, they both have, uh, they both have different challenges. In the Hadoop uh, stack, the initial challenge was really maturing the platform, securing the platform. Now uh, this year uh, is big in terms of having data governance, for example, right? People started talking about data governance. With Spark, maturing the Spark as a platform is going to be uh, the next step. So that will be the challenge uh, for uh, Spark. However, Spark is very good tool for the just exploration and interactive queries, getting something uh, quickly done uh, by data scientists. So those use cases are very suitable. And uh, you don't have to kind of worry about some of the uh, things, uh, the enterprise uh, uh, data warehouse architectures about governance and security in those uh, some of the uh, use cases. And that adoption can be happening from data scientist team. Uh, they have different uh, challenges at this measured cycle. But you see them as complementary, is what, I, what, I, what I'm hearing. At this point, I see no, them complementary. Of course, the Databricks survey, George, they think they threw out the number 46% of the... 48. 48% said, okay, <laughs> splitting here, who's counting? So 48% <laughs> said that they were do, doing yes. Spark independent of Hadoop. Now that could have been pilots, it could have been tire kicking, and yep. so that yeah. could be a marketing number, but, but Tendu, I'm, I'm inferring from your comments yeah. that you would expect those two worlds to coexist for quite some time. Yes. That's what uh, uh, Would it I be expect. fair to say, uh, uh, Hadoop has a lot of moving parts. Uh, the, the pro is that there's incredible innovation that all the parts are sort of evolving independently of each other, they're not held back. So, but the, the downside of that is there's a fair amount of complexity on development and operations. Whereas Spark, um, 
it's one sort of framework and then uh, increasingly integrated set of APIs. So from a development uh, perspective, it seems to be simplifying, especially as we get these notebook tools in mm -hmm. front of it. And operationally, if someone's going to run it as a service for you, it would seem to remove some of the, the operational complexity. That's correct, yes. And that's what we're wondering about is, like running it as a service may be sort of the tire kickers right now, and um, that Hadoop has a lot more work to do to get to that level of development and operational simplicity. Yeah, Databricks is doing a great job, uh, basically, mm -hmm. with that uh, 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 offering as a hosted environment and uh, simplifying the operational uh, part. They are uh, definitely doing a great job. Uh, I, I think uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, combining different types of workloads, having also uh, the uh, Spark running a batch in addition to real-time type of uh, workloads, all of those uh, uh, have to uh, uh, go through the enterprise maturity cycle. Uh, we see a lot of uh, pilot projects, a lot of uh, proof of concepts happening uh, with Spark, and which is, uh, th uh, I think the Databricks survey announced 600 contributors, which is great, and uh, we will be supporting the project, uh, and uh, we will definitely help bringing diverse uh, data sets uh, uh, for processing in Spark. I think Hadoop, at this point, because where it is in the maturity cycle and adoption in the enterprise, the vendors, the Hadoop vendors like Cloudera, uh, Hortonworks, and Mapar are really uh, uh, ready focusing, for ready, ready for production. They are in production already. Fair. So that's, that's mm. really, and our announcement with Dell, Intel, and Cloudera last week is also about that. Having an appliance uh, where Syncsort, uh, Cloudera, and Dell jointly offers a simple uh, uh, appliance for uh, uh, offloading expensive workloads, augmenting the data warehouse, uh, for example. So Syncsort, Cloudera, and Dell? Yes, yeah. Dell, Cloudera, yeah. Intel, and Syncsort. Okay, Tendu, we're out of time, but uh, last question, sort of the way forward for Syncsort, what's, what's ahead for you guys? Yes, uh, be ready to hear from us. Uh, a lot of innovation is uh, coming uh, 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 end of this year and uh, early uh, in uh, 2016. We will continue to focus on uh, bridging uh, uh, the gap between uh, mainframe and open source and we will continue to innovate about uh, um, making life easier for organizations uh, and reducing their operational and uh, 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 business costs. All right, Tendu Yogochu, thank you very much for coming on theCUBE and sharing SyncSort's vision, your vision. Um, awesome, really thank appreciate you. it. Thank All you. Right, keep thank right there, you everybody, we'll be back with our next guest. This is theCUBE, we're live from Big Data NYC at Strata and Hadoop World. Right back.